Would you welcome, uh, really, someone who's been a great uh, example to uh, us? He didn't crash land after Bible school like some of us. I pray that you won't do that. But he, he just took off. Why are you laughing, Charlie? Why? You're not going to do that. God bless you. And he took off to the country of Benin, right? And, uh, and I remember meeting Paul uh, like a number of years ago in London. He comes from Northern Ireland like Amy Carmichael. That's where she comes from. And uh, so just feel free for a few minutes. You can introduce this class. You have the subject. Okay. Thank you, Lord, for tonight. Thank you for the awesome privilege to be members of your body and to hear what we'll hear tonight and just to be called by you and loved by you for your, uh, worked upon within by you and just be glorified in Jesus name amen okay uh, so the theme the theme of tonight's class is I believe God uses people. Is that right, Pastor Adam? How God uses people. Okay. Okay. So we're. Whoops. Um, how God uses people. A just a couple of thoughts about that. And. Uh, yeah, if you want to turn to 1 Corinthians a chapter 1. Pastor Adam told me he'll be... <laughs> I don't know if he's still going to be using 1 Corinthians 1, but... Okay. Um, just a picture, picture, just if you want a picture with me. Um, uh, somebody, like a baseball field, and... Somebody, um, God says to you, right, the, the, on the baseball field, there's Goliaths, like 10 feet high, and the devil is pitching, right? And God says to you, step up to the plate. <laughs> and that's a little bit like missions. <laughs> a, that's, God calls us into something that that is too high for us, <laughs> and and uh, and yet He calls us into this. <laughs> he doesn't do it Himself. Well, He does, but He He calls us to do it. But hey, let's just read. Um, well, we won't read that yet. And so, like you get there, you walk up, and you're trembling, <laughs> you know, and you you. You stand on the base, <laughs> and all of a sudden the devil you know, pitches, and then like all of a sudden you're picked up in the air, and you know it's it's a home run. A we think we've got to do the swinging, <laughs> but it's God that does the swinging. It's God uses us, and it's not uh, we use God. A, like, you know, some some movements that that you know want to use God like a credit card, but it's not also that you know we do this work. It's just God literally uses us. You know, it's and it's really a it's an awesome thing when it's that way. Um, yeah, I, I have a load of thoughts here. Well, not a load, but a few thoughts, but <laughs> I hope, pray the order of the thoughts will come out. I, but just some some brief thoughts here. Um, that's like, that's just what happens. So who does God use? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 1. Because God uses people, but what kind of people does he use? You know? Maybe he uses some people, but not others, you know. Maybe I'm not qualified, you know. Maybe if somebody feels like they're not qualified. But I'm not going to go much into this chapter. But obviously, I'm not going to go much at all. But a like this chapter, uh, 
You see your calling, brethren, verse 26, how that not many wise after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Hmm. And it doesn't say none, but it says not many. And, uh, but noble, the word noble is like well-born, a, like people that are well-born, a, like, what is it, a eugenis, eugenis, like good genes, kind of, I mean, that's what it means, good genes, like not all of us have good genes, <laughs> like, if we look at our family tree, <laughs> and, you know, not many of those, but that's okay, because not many who have good genes are called, or that follow, choose to walk, to respond to God's call, a they can, but not many. And and so it's okay. Like one of the things I just wanted to share, Pastor Matty shared this once at a Silver Spring uh, church. It was a church plant, the beginning of the Silver Spring church. And he shared once in a staff meeting, and it encouraged me. Uh, he says, it's okay to be the weaker member of the team, you know, in the body. It's okay to be a weaker member, and he says at any given time, you could be the weak member, you know, on a team, right? A, there's moments, and like 1 Corinthians 12, 22 says, name much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. So uh, don't beat yourself up if you think you're more feeble, <laughs> you know? It's okay to be weak, to be used by God. A uh, next, like nobody is sufficient for these things. Um, like we're not. We had that illustration of we being the bat and God swinging it. A we're not. We don't have to, like God could swing a toothbrush and hit a home run. You know, <laughs> He doesn't. We don't have to. We're not state of the art Christians or state of the art missionaries. A we're just members of His body. And whether we be seemingly whatever, you know, but we're all just weak members of his body. Eh? And we are, uh, it's, it's just a good, just something to rest in for us is like, God's not asking me to, to do this, you know. He has a work and he's doing it and he's inviting me to be a part of it. And, and I just step up, you know, <laughs> maybe with fear and trembling, but I can find in that stepping up. Remember Pastor Schaller's illustration? It, uh, was it Sunday morning? Uh, he said, like, you go like this, and the coat, you know, fell on the ground. Like, we, we find something when we go, when we, in the call of God, we can find they just, I get swung, you know. It's just like, and something happened. <laughs> something happened, and you're like, what just happened? A, if we had to base it on what well, you know, I feel already, I think I can handle this, you know. Like, uh, come on, devil, give it your best shot. We can say that in Christ in boldness if we trust God and we know God, but by faith, but knowing that it's God that's going to do the, do what is needed. Uh, and that's just so awesome because it takes all the pressure off our shoulders. Like, this is not my work. It's his work. He, it's the battle belongs to the Lord. A, uh, it's just amazing. And, and uh, a, maybe just read Isaiah 41. Well, an example, well, I just... Maybe a personal example. I remember in Heidelberg, Germany, I think I just saw a Heidelbergian. Is there a Heidelbergian in the room? I think I saw oh, there she is. <laughs> but she wasn't, we, she wasn't there at the time. But I remember going to Heidelberg a, with uh, Pastor Gary. Um, we would, I was visit there with them for a practicum. And uh, he just says to me, like, one day, can you teach the class, <laughs> you know, on, Gre on Greece, Grace? Uh, and, uh, you know, trembling, you know, trembling, and you don't, I have no idea what I'm going to say. And then you stand there, and 
And then all of a sudden, you have something to say. And it's like, where did, what happened, <laughs> you know? A, and, and it was, and it, it, it seems edifying, you know? It's, it's like God does his work. And uh, same thing in Benin. I remember Pastor Luigi, sometimes he couldn't go to the Bible study, you know, in this other city. We would jump on a taxi motorbike. We'd go like 30 minutes into the city center to the to the to the the market place where there's piles of people you just jump in one of these little vans you're squeezed in we go another hour to this place you're sweating and i just remember one a few times like he said i can't do, can you do it and i go in like i have it's a sunday afternoon you're hot you're tired you know the week at the end I was exhausted. My brain feels like it's just like a ball of heat, you know. I just I, I don't know what. There's no like cl clarity in, at all. And then you get there, and I remember sitting there once, like a, like an hour or half an hour before, in this little classroom. It was a group of about six to ten people, a but an awesome group. And and I remember just sitting there, like I am. Oh God. <laughs> I don't know what, I have, I have nothing, you know, right? And then all of a sudden, you have something, you know? I had a, and you, and you go home like, wow, that was awesome, <laughs> you know? I, I'm, you know, you're built up, and you see that God, God did something, and, you know, there's always the fact of God, there's always also the process of God humbling, you know, like Nebuchadnezzar, you know? When we personalize the work of God, hmm. a... Like, in two ways, we can personalize it. One is the obvious, where it's like somebody does something in God, you know, rich, you know, God is glory, and then he turns around and says, look what I did, you know. Like Nebuchadnezzar said, look at this great kingdom, you know, that I built, <laughs> you know. And, and then God says, okay, <laughs> you know, and he's, you know, let's ch cut down the tree. And, and it says, why did God do it that all may know to the intent that the living may know that God uses the basis, and I'm paraphrasing, God uses the basest of man, the basest of man, you know? Like God, that's who God uses, the basest of man. <laughs> that's us. That's the body of Christ. And, and, uh, but in Christ, we are more than that, of course. And, and so God has this, he humbled Nebuchadnezzar. He left, he said, but leave the stump in the earth, you know? God doesn't remove the call, but he, 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 he humbles us in the call to show that it's him, that it's his work, a, it's his grace that does it. And just read this in Isaiah to finish. Yeah, I just love this verse because this passage just encourages me. Um, to whom have I taken from the ends of the earth? Oh, but thy, O Israel, sorry, thy Israel, verse 8 of Isaiah 41. Uh, yeah, but thou Israel are my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief man thereof. I think that means there's chief man, but God called us. <laughs> you know, there's the chief man in the earth, and then there's us, <laughs> and God took us from the chief man, a, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. That, that's missions. I, I will strengthen thee. I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Missions is God with us. And, and, uh, and then it says just a little later on, Fear not thy worm, Jacob. You men of Israel, I will help thee, says the Lord and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument, having teeth. Thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small, and make the hills as chaff. Thou shalt fan them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the whirlwind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord, and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. Like... That's just, that's great. It's easy when, the, when God does it. <laughs> and, it 
And it's, yeah, God, God knows how to swing a worm and hit a home run. <laughs> That's, amen. How many people here, you've been over, you've, you've left the border, you've crossed the border? Wow. Frequent travelers here you are. Oh, wow. How many haven't? You've never been overseas yet? All right. Not yet. You come from Africa. You've been overseas. So. <laughs> oh, you just, okay. I got you. All right. Whose mission is it? It's God's, right? It's really his, his I mean, it's really his mission. Um, it's his enterprise that we're, that we're you know, a part of. Um, but for some reason, he's chosen to not go it alone without us. All right? Um, Let's read Acts 10. There's a great passage here with Peter and Cornelius. Acts 10. So we're, so Cornelius is like a Roman captain. And uh, of course, they're under the rule of Rome, so he's really like the enemy um, from another culture, and you wouldn't really want to be with him naturally. Uh, but he, but he has been praying, has has been praying, and verse two, a devout man, one that feared God with all his heart gave much arms to the people and prayed to God always. I do like that. I do f I feel like there are people that are kind of just ready wherever God has you. I've, I've experienced that. Wherever I've been in the world, there's always been someone that God has been preparing. All right? I like what he said about the don't be afraid to be the weakest member on the team. You know, there's people that that only you can that God has tailored them for you and you for them. People that maybe the, the pastor of the team maybe, you know, can connect with, and then other people that are just for you, that God has prepared for you. Uh, and... In verse 3, he saw a vision clearly about the ninth hour of the day. I believe that's 3 in the afternoon. And of an angel, an angel of God coming to him and saying, Cornelius, I want to lead you in sharing the gospel with you, and I want to show to you that God is real, and I would like to, I would like you to get saved today. Is that what it says? No, it doesn't. What's going on here? There's some kind of mistake. Imagine this. God sends an angel to Cornelius, but the angel's not going to be the missionary. <laughs> the holy, perfect angel who's never sinned before this is what he says. When he, when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Your prayers and alms have come up for a memorial before God. Now, send men, send messengers to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. Remember the one that denied Christ? <laughs> you know, and uh, the one who had racial issues and in Galatians chapter 2 and Acts chapter 15 with non-Jews. The perfect angel says, I want you to call that guy there and he's going he's gonna to share with you. <laughs> like This is absurd, all right? But yet this is God's way. He has chosen um, 
for us to be the weak, the weak link that he won't dispose of. He's chosen the, the weak method, all right? Man looks like he read in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. Man is so puffed up and pompous and intelligent that he expects God to play by his rules, you know. Send me someone that will impress me. And God deliberately chooses this weak method. God will not operate independently of man. All right? He's chosen to have a partnership. Perfect God with imperfect man is going to reach imperfect man. Not him unilaterally without us. This is so unique. And so the angel, I mean, says, would you, I want you to go and call Peter. And Peter walks in. It's, it's quite, quite unique because the first thing he says is, you know, it's not lawful for me to be with you. <laughs> I don't advise that, you know, when you, when you go on, on a mission trip. You, you know that, it, like, I shouldn't even be with you people. <laughs> but really, that's the first thing that comes out of his mouth, and then he starts to tell the story. And then it says, while he yet spake, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. Like, this is so amazing. It's a testimony to the angels the angels look in and they, they, they marvel and they learn when they see a sinner saved by grace who's experienced grace, who's experienced mercy, ministering to another sinner. What's the prerequisite for being a, mission, a missionary? You've got to be a sinner, all right? Don't tell Pastor Aiden I said that, all right? No. No, really. I mean, this is qualification number one really a sinner that has experienced mercy. It's something real for you that the angel had never, the angel, let me look at me funny, yep. Did the angel, was the angel a sinner? Disqualified. <laughs> All right. The angel, I mean, he could talk about mercy in a kind of a, you know, theoretical way. But Peter had experienced Jesus looking to him after his denial they say when I do this, that's what it, <laughs> they, they say. <laughs> but Peter had experienced a Christ in John 21, looking at him after his denial and saying, you will, will feed my sheep, you know. And it had, so, it had had such a profound effect on him that when he stands up in Acts 2, I believe it's 38, and he says, he says, I mean, he says, you denied the Holy One of Israel. Looking at, you know, he's, he, he denied Christ, and yet he stands up and says, you denied the Holy One of Israel. That's, I mean, he, it, what, you got a memory problem, Peter? You got, you got issues? Like, you know, this guy was the, a vessel that God had ch chosen to, to use to display he was an example of mercy. You are, and I am an example of, of mercy. That's why it's so amazing that we, we don't have to be something, you know, as a, as a missionary, wherever you are. I don't have to be something. I am a manifestation of, of God's mercy. We're mercy walking, all right? And as such, what an amazing, what an amazing privilege. And really, Peter is nothing, but actually, he's an important link, right, that God has chosen, the weak link that God will not dispose of, that God will not, you know, do without. He has a disciple, I think Pastor Monty said that at Eurocon, he's, he's decided, forgive me for quoting all these people, I just love it. Um, he has to, he's decided, uh, what did he say? Let's think. He said that, that, uh, oh, anyone remember what I'm thinking right now? Uh, oh gosh, it's escaped me. Uh, he, no, he, he had a great statement about this at Eurocon. Come on, some of you went there. About, he's decided, uh, oh, it's gone. 
No, that wasn't it. <laughs> that was good, though. Uh, uh, okay. Getting embarrassed. All right. He's, uh, okay, he said, if we don't go to, if, if greater grace didn't go to Amman, greater grace wouldn't be in Amman. And, and then, <laughs> oh, we are the, uh, the weak method, was it? We are the... Oh, he, he, uh, missions is that that divine program that God has made just a little bit to depend on us. That's good. That was it. Missions is that divine program that God has made just a little bit to depend on us. Now, of course, he's sovereign. He can do what he will, and it doesn't depend on us. But in this sense... God is revealing something here. Like, I, I'm, I'm using man. That's why I left you on earth. I, I'm using man. I've made it just a little bit to depend on you. Yeah, that divine program, which he has made to just a little bit d- depend uh, on us. So, Israel is in a horrible backslidden condition. And God calls Isaiah, he says, whom shall we send and who will go for us? Imagine God's like, you know, he's he's there and God's like, I wonder who shall we send and who will go for us, you know? And and Isaiah, let's read it. This is a good thing. Isaiah, Isaiah 6. The weak method. He sees the vision. Verse 3, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. And verse 4, and the posts of the door, this is the base of the door of the temple, moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled in smoke. Then Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the king. Lord of hosts. Then one of the, the, the seraphs, one, one, then one of the seraphs uh, flew unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues of the altar, and laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lord, uh, lo, this has touched thy lips, thy iniquity is taken away, and your sin has been purged. When God, when God contemplates using us, he does it in the context of like, I've already dealt with your sin. Would you meet me on, the, on those grounds? And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then said I, here am I, send me. Isn't that awesome? When, when, I, when I realize my sin has been completely dealt with, then, then I learn... In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, not to hide my weaknesses or disguise my weaknesses or pretend about my weaknesses, but to be really honest about my weaknesses. In fact, 12, 9 of 2 Corinthians says that we glory in our weaknesses. What does that mean, glory in your weaknesses? Could somebody ask your neighbor, like, what does it mean to glory in your weaknesses? Uh, anyone know what that means? Glory. And... Let's not sugarcoat it. Let's get explicit. What does it mean to glory? What does it mean to glory? What is the opposite? What's the opposite of glorying in your weaknesses? What? Denial, right. What's the opposite of glorying in your weaknesses? Denying them? Pretending? Chad? 
Charlie? What does it mean? To be glorying in your weaknesses. Submit them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Only, only when, I, when I'm up front about it and saying, God, what did he say in, in Isaiah 6? He said, I'm a man of unclean lips, you know. Only when I'm up front about it, you know, not denying them, submitting them. That's when, when God can, I like, I like this idea that, that God calls us to give our all because he doesn't need our all. Like, remember the mighty men with David? They came, like, bring the water, and, and he's like, that's awesome, just pours it out on the ground. <laughs> and we think, you know, that when we come to God and we give him our life, he's, like, really excited about that. Like, wow, that's amazing. I've got, like, and he's, he's like, that's awesome. <laughs> that's how he uses us. Because your life gets in the way of him wanting to express his life and your weaknesses are not actually something that are by mistake, but are there and actually may be the reason why he calls me. Isn't it interesting that, you know, he calls the non-speaker to be the speaker in the case of Moses, right? He calls the idol, you know, craftsman to be the high priest in the case of Aaron, right? He calls the fisherman, unlearned fisherman Peter to be the author of they say the, the, the Greek in First and Second Peter is, is like of the highest level. It's like really, really quite, um, quite amazing. Because when I come to God with my weakness, and instead of denying it, I'm upfront about it, you know, God's victory, I, this is a watchman he quote, God's victory always has leftovers. Man's victory never has leftovers. It's just enough. Victory that's just enough uh, is, is your own victory. He used, he used Matthew 6 with a, the turning the other cheek. You know, uh, do, you, do you get what I'm saying? God's not looking for me to have propped up weaknesses. He's looking for us to, you know, be very, very, uh, actually, glory in our weaknesses. This is a, this is a, a lesson I learn uh, in missions, to glory in our weaknesses. So he doesn't operate independently of man. He does, he, we are the weak link that he won't uh, dispose of. And he never usurps the authority of our free volition. He never usurps the authority of our free volition. He's, he's given us the gift of free volition. And we've said this before. It's like a scepter. You can either raise it or you can lower it. He's made us kings with a free volition, with the power to choose. And you say, God, why would you, be, you have such a weak like method? All right? He, because he, he wants us to voluntarily go, you know, not against our will, but voluntarily go. And that's why I, I look back to our little experience in Kitwe as a complete miracle, because it was, uh, it was something that was just totally, like, God 100% did it. I was talking to my wife about it the other day. Like, like there was no, there was absolute, there was no, like, big budget. <laughs> I'm, I'm, oh, my gosh. Yeah. I remember one time, uh, we were talking to you about it the other day. I remember one time, you know, the budget was so bad that, I shouldn't be saying this in an intro to missions. You're not going to want to go into missions, but <laughs> one particular month, the budget was so bad that she had given me this, uh, it was called maize meal. You call it like grits, you know. You put it in water and 
you have it for breakfast, and by like 9.30, you're hungry again. It was like <laughs> every day, like for a month, you know. And uh, the budget was horrible, and yet we would not condescend to allowing it to be some kind of a... We, we never brought in, you know, uh, kind of r religious, trying to get people to do things but just letting it be that, that there was freedom. You come if you want, and, and there's no guilt trips, there's no, there's no pressure, there's no you know, uh, human tactics, big marketing campaigns. It was just literally God using an extremely weak zero. Don't you love that passage? Not many might. Let's read it again. This is awesome. This is, this is really, this is, the, this is the absolute heart of missions, 1 Corinthians 1. That God, that, that you, you're, you're, a, you're a real clever church, aren't you? You know, you're an awesome church. Wow, you got a polis. Great, with the amazing eloquence. And I'm of Paul, and I'm of a polis. You're really intelligent people. And, uh, Paul said, and, and, and by the way, you've, you've grown out of Paul, right? Because he's not the real deal. And uh, wow, you, you could do so. You got amazing gifts, right? Your tongue speaking, uh, they, they're preaching, they got the whole thing down. They, they had this thing like clockwork. And Paul just comes in, starts taking them through the Bible, and says, he says that, that, for you see your calling, brethren, 26, 126, now that not many wise men according to the flesh. What did the wise men according to the flesh do? They crucified Christ. They didn't even know that, that their creator was standing right in front of them. This is not a matter of our human intellect. This is not a matter of like, like planting a Ford Motors industry factory in, in Mexico or a or a, you know, a Dunkin' Donuts in London. This is something that you have no clue how to do it. This is something that, that, that God's deliberately called you. Yep, you're stupid, and that's why he called you. And glory in your stupidity. Uh, and when you got nothing to say, that's awesome. That's the beginning of having something redemptive to say. And when you, and when you feel like you got nothing, that's perfect. Glory in that. It's awesome to be a zero. That's exactly why God called you. He did it on purpose. And, uh, yep, I'm talking to you right there. Someone in Florida said, said man, when you, do you have a photographic memory? When you quote the Bible, you look into heaven. I don't know what that is. <laughs> no, I don't. I got a stupid memory. I cannot memorize verses. If I do, I forget it in, like, one day. I mean, I just don't. I really do not. I don't, I don't remember. I have a horrible... I couldn't even tell you. I had to sit there for hours trying to memorize my social security number for some <laughs> stupid interview. I didn't even know. 218 something. I don't know. I literally, I mean, I know my phone number. I don't... I, 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 it's forgotten. I've forgotten my social security uh, number. I don't know it. don't plan to learn it. I know my address. All right? I know my wife's birthday. And that's about it. <laughs> Uh, and that's it. I don't waste. I went through four years. I never once knew what the next class was because other people could figure that out. I don't waste my brain cells and stuff like that that other people can do. And God says, "Yep, I'll use you right there." Yeah. Not many. He says, "Not uh, not many." Where are we? You see your calling. This is what kind of a calling it is. Yeah, it's a good thing to be embarrassed when someone says, what do you do, and you can't really articulate and work. Well, we, uh, I, I started out, I used to like try and put it in humanitarian. Yeah, we are, you know, we do mission work in Africa and orphans and all that kind of stuff. And because people like enjoy that, it kind of, that like makes sense to their worldly live for now mentality. I like that. Their worldly live for now mentality. Actually, the world kind of applauds that kind of stuff, right? But that's not why I'm here, and that's not why I'm there. I'm there to reveal 
someone else, another kingdom. I'm there to, to reveal another spirit, another life, another, uh, uh, another mind. I'm there to reveal forgiveness and mercy and love and, 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 a, and a life that's from above and to be submitted to the Holy Spirit using me. Try and tell that to the guy on the plane next to you. He'd look like, you what? <laughs> Can I have another seat, right? That's good. That's the kind of calling we have. It's strange. It doesn't fit in a little drop-down box, you know. Us, that, uh, other. We're like other, right? <laughs> That's good. I like that because I'm from another kingdom and I got another calling and it didn't come from man and I can never be fired. And God provides for my need. How do you finance your mission? I don't even know. I've never asked anyone for one quarter, dollar, penny, or cent and never intend to, and I've turned money away as well. It's just, this is the kind of calling we have. You see your calling, he says, that not many wise men after the flesh, not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty and not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Frank from China, as he's, we, we, we're sitting in the Greek marketplace, and in, in, uh, you're not related, right? You related? Oh, you know him, okay. Sitting in a Greek marketplace in, uh, in uh, Cyprus this past year. Pastor Shah says, why don't we do street preaching? I said, hey, Pastor Shah, why don't we get the Chinese guy to preach in Chinese? He's like, yeah, that's a good idea. So, so he starts preaching. He's, I'm like, in Chinese. They're Greek. He's Chinese. And then the young, his young little nephew, he says, you translate into English. I'm like, this is going to be fun, you know. I didn't realize the guy's got like a low voice. So, the, so Frank's preaching. And the, and the, the nephew is going, for God so love. For God so loved the world, where he gave. And the Greeks are walking by like, you know, you know Mr. Bean. Like. <laughs> the Greeks are walking by like, what the heck is going on here? You got a Chinese guy going berserk and a young guy whose volume is on like half. <laughs> and they're coming by and people are getting tracks and people are getting saved. And it's like God is like, this is awesome, you know. That, there's glory in that. I'd rather take that any day than some humanly engineered system with all your sophisticated human engineering of the flesh. A flesh job. Really awesome, amazing. Let's prove to the world how that we're just as cool as them. God's not even in your building. Wow, it's a curveball. It's as amazing. God's got Jonah who's walking around, and he's the first white missionary. <laughs> he was bleached white from, from whale acids walking around. <laughs> Just to like confound our ideas about what, and he doesn't even want to be there. Now I'm not saying we shouldn't want to be there, even though I didn't want to be there when I first went. But the, but the point is, this is God's thing, and let God do it His way, how He wants to do it. And if it seems a little bit like, like He's made some kind of a mistake, maybe that's just His sense of humor. He's chosen the weak things to do what? What's His purpose in it? The weak things of this world to confound the things which are mighty. The base things of this world and the things which are despised has God chosen. Yea, the things that are, n just in case you didn't fit into any of those categories, the things that are nothings, you know. Like <laughs> the, okay, so that, that includes all of us, right? The thing, and the things that are not, that no flesh should glory in his presence, that at the end of it, you just say, that was an absolute miracle. And I honestly, I can honestly say, my, my testimony, a miracle from start to finish. 
not that it's finished. Did I just say that? X that. All right. A miracle from start to finish. I mean, the fact that God could use Joe, Pastor Joe Roach in Africa. <laughs> he wouldn't mind me telling this story. <laughs> oh, gosh. Sophie Petridis, who's walking around Zambia saying, Mazungu Akakundani, which she doesn't realize that means the white people love you. Instead of God loves you, she's saying the white people love you. And man, I look at her like, really? <laughs> what, what is going on? Molly Harrison, is she, is she here? Who said, she said it in their language. Man, instead of, you know, my, she said Mandela loves you. <laughs> <In the local. laughs> Don't take yourself too seriously, right? God using people like the trumpet last night, you know? We're just instruments. We really are. We're, we're instruments. And the more quirky the instrument is, the greater the testimony it is. All right? Let me read this. This is a cool one here, and then we'll have a, uh, we'll have a break. Um, Slesser. There we go. There she is. Mary Slesser. She's on, she's on a Scottish banknote. Um, 158. All right, there we go. Mary Slesser. Goes, she went to Nigeria. She, she walked barefooted a long time, a lot of, a lot of the time. Born to, born to a red-haired, working-class woman who lived African-style in a mud hut. She was the second of seven children born in Scotland in 1848. She's number two of seven. Her childhood was marred by poverty and family strife, during, due largely to her, the sporadic work habits of her alcoholic father, who had been known to throw Mary out into the streets alone at night after he had come home drunk. At age 11, she began working alongside her mother at the textile, uh, at the textile mills. And, and at 14, she was working 10-hour days. For the next 13 years, she continued in the mills and was the primary wage earner in her family. Converted as a youngster, through an elderly widow in the neighborhood, went to a Presbyterian church. In her early 20s, began working in the Queen Street Mission with open-air uh, meetings and uh, facing loud mouth thugs and bawdy street gangs. And uh, she applied and went to the Calabar Mission in Nigeria, one of the only ones that made room for women. The death of David Livingston clinched her decision. 1875, she moved there at the age of 27, sailed for Calabar along in present-day Nigeria, taught in a mission school, picked up the language. Her heart was set on doing pioneering work in the interior. After several attacks of malaria, and I've had it, it's the most horrible. I had it in year one. You're like throwing up, you're going that way as well, and you're sitting in the hot sun and you're shaking. And uh, she was furloughed to regain her strength and then returned to Africa with a new assignment in a new city, new, in, a, in a new, uh, in Old Town, a new place three miles further inland along the Calabar River. Living in a mud hut, eating local produce, she constantly would send most of her missionary salary back to her family back home and began to mother unwanted children. They had the, the, tw the, the thing where they would kill the second born of a twin. And on Sunday, she became a circuit preacher. People didn't like that she was preaching. She said, if you want to take my place, it's open for any guy who'll do it. She would go from village to village sharing the gospel, dealt with the customs of twin murder, and she not only rescued twins but ministered to their mothers on the second furlough um, after her second furlough she came back to with 
with an objective to penetrate further into the territory. She walked around barefoot, and she received word of her mother's death. She said, there's no one else to write all my stories back home to. She was convinced that pioneer work was best accomplished by a woman in 1888. She went further north. For the next quarter of a century and more, she would go into areas where no Western man was, had ever been able to survive. Her reputation as a peacemaker got her set up as a judge in, in the communities. She never had much fruit in terms of a lot of souls saved, but she viewed her work as preparatory. She saw some fruit from her evangelistic endeavors, mainly in her own family of adopted children. And during one of her sick leaves on the coast, she met Charles Morrison, a young missionary teacher, 18 years her junior, serving in Duke Town. As their friendship grew, they fell in love, and she accepted his marriage proposal, providing he would work with her in the interior. The marriage, however, never took place as his health did not permit him to leave, uh, to remain in Duke Town. And, her, and, and for Mary, her, her missionary service came before personal relationships. 1904, at age 55, she moved on to go further into the interior with her, uh, her seven children to do more pioneer work in other remote areas. And in 1915, after 40 years, nearly 40 years after coming to Africa, she died at age 66 in her mud hut. Working class, normal woman, right? A lot of people came on the team, couldn't, couldn't work with her. Found her, you know, she was she was able to live in squalor and all that kind of thing, and um, and God uses this to confound confound the wise. I've got a picture here of a hundred years later. This is in Nigeria, a big billboard that's put up. She's seen as someone who who really had an impact in that country, and I, you know, I I. I feel like people like this, you know, we, we, we go to Africa and we see all this amazing fruit, but really, you know, they, they laid such an amazing groundwork. And, um, <clears throat> mm. Amen? Okay. What are you looking at me for? Should we have a break? <laughs> all right. Let's have a break. We have 10 minutes. We'll come and finish it off.